Right. So, um, you know, I did my PhD field work uh, at this site called as the Cobbett Tiger Reserve in Uttarakhand in India. Um, and my uh, and I picked Cobbett specifically because of its very unique history and the wide range of uh, digital surveillance technologies that are used here. Uh, it also has uh, the most dense tiger population at a single site in the world. And it was like the first national park to be declared in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, it's also very glamorous in terms of tourism. So there's a lot of tourism there and it's, uh, you know, it's got many charismatic species other than the tiger as well, like elephants uh, and a large human population that lives in the fringes of the national park. And there are four kinds of uh, prevalent conservation technologies that are used uh, in Cobet. Uh, so you've got camera traps, there are drones. Uh, in particularly in Cobet, they, they are called warriors of the forests. So, so there's a drone security force that is deployed there. And uh, very uniquely, there's something called as an electronic eye system, which is uh, like a very powerful thermal camera, which has a range of about 15 kilometers. Um, uh, and uh, it's deployed on the boundaries of the tiger reserve, specifically on the southern boundary. I'll come to that little later. And uh, fourth, there's a mobile application called as M-Stripes that is basically used to uh, uh, you know, uh, surveil uh, workplace sur surveillance for of forest guards and forest labor, uh, just like Smart, uh, but th this is the Indian version of Smart, and it's called M Stripes. I will not be talking much about M Stripes. Maybe we can discuss that in the questions, but I'll be particularly talking about the impact that camera traps, drones, and this electronic EI system has. So what I did was I did I used ethnographic methods uh, um, and I conducted some structure and informal interviews and participant observations and focus group discussions. Um, um, I, this was pretty detailed. I spent 14 months uh, uh, situating myself in the landscape. I conducted over 270 interviews, 90 hours of participant observations and many focus group discussions. Um, and uh, my uh, my field, uh, you know, the villages that I uh, surveyed people, uh, th there were different kinds of villages. Uh, there were certain villages that are called revenue villages where people have land titles on their name. There are villages that are forest villages where people don't have land titles on them and are extremely dependent on um, on the on on that for their livelihood on the forest. And there are encroached sites, uh, and this is very important because. Uh, surveillance or the the impacts of the technologies is experienced in different ways according to the administrative status of the village and the social composition of these villages. So my research shows that technologies like camera traps have a very disproportionate impact on women. Uh, there is a huge gendered uh, equation on this. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that uh, it is the women of the house in this state or uh, in this region. Uh, that go to collect firewood and grass in the forest for their daily livelihood needs. So every morning, uh, groups of young and old women would go from villages into the forest to collect grass and firewood. And during my observations, it became very clear that this traditional practice was not just to collect resources for their livelihood, but also acted as an opportunity for social interaction between women. So in a deeply patriarchal society, the forest was the only space for freedom where women would discuss village gossip or personal household stories, gossiping, gossiping about their husbands or gossiping about their mother-in-laws. And this space is often invaded by deployed camera traps, altering the behavior of women. So women also traditionally sing songs loudly while collecting forest produce. Um, and uh, whenever camera traps were around, women would actively resist singing. So this has consequences, not just uh, in terms of changing their cultural practice, uh, but the primary reason for singing very loudly is to keep large wildlife like tigers and elephants away. And that got in, and camera traps got in the way of doing that. So furthermore, camera traps often catch women in comprising, uh, you know, in compromising acts such as relieving themselves or in a position where their clothes are not in order of the accepted cultural norm. So as I described in the next slide, this has very severe implications on privacy and has given rise to a case of sexual harassment in my field site as well. So let me just read out a few quotes from, from the slide. Uh, there is a you know, there's a woman who's telling me that why do they, as in the state, as in the government, have to put cameras on the exact paths we take to go to the forest? When we start walking around the cameras, they force us to walk in front. Otherwise, they do not let us collect firewood. They say the tigers too will walk on the path created by us, avoiding the camera traps. 
uh, there's another conversation where one woman's telling me one woman's picture of relieving herself came in that camera of theirs instead of deleting the photo they circulated it in their phone so this was a major issue that uh, resulted in a case of sexual harassment of uh, uh, you know of a of a woman from a marginalized community by forest guards in in this reserve uh there's also this conversation uh, uh which i was you know i was i was a participant observation i was listening to this where one woman says the other day he hit me he, she's talking about her husband uh while the other woman says quiet there is a camera trap attached here so there are these uh, uh you know implications that uh, traps can have um so my research also shows that the use of drones in the kobet tiger reserve is completely for surveillance and not for any kind of ecological purposes or monitoring uh, and this surveillance actually changes in intensity according to who is being surveilled so uh, as part of my research i traveled with the drone team or the task force regularly in a vehicle that looked like it was straight out of the cia or the fbi a black vehicle uh, you know with uh, with army army kind of uh, symbolism all over it um every morning the team would drive to a village adjoining the boundary of the tiger reserve and in full public view fly the drone on the boundaries of the village and the forest uh this however changes according to the village where the surveillance is being done for example in the forest villages that are dominated by lower caste or marginalized groups drones would be flown from within the villages uh, over top of people's homes and when a crowd gathers they would be told about how the aircraft even flies at night is synchronized with their social security numbers uh, in india we call them aadhar cards and that they would be immediately identified and caught by a team from the national capital so not even the state capital obviously these are all this is all misinformation but that's the kind of fear that is being instilled when uh, when when this technology is being practiced uh, this practice changes considerably when the drone is actually flown alongside a village dominated by say powerful class groups or upper caste groups in these villages the drone team would first call the village headman and ask his permission before flying it here the drone is flown at the boundaries of the forest and not in the village or from within the village what is interesting here is that the village headman often directs the drone team to fly the drone over areas that are inhabited by marginalized caste groups and this practice actually has been discussed very heavily in the discipline called surveillance studies which and it is called a social sorting within within surveillance studies um i spoke to a senior forest official from this state and uh, asked him why this uh, why are drones being used in kobet and he was very clear that our basic mandate for using drones is to create psychological terror uh, and not you know ecological monitoring though it is also used sometimes for you know crocodile counts and things like that but it is very little most of it is actually used for uh, you know law enforcement efforts so these are a few quotes from some of my interviews uh, relating to drone so there is this first quote on the left where uh, somebody from a lower caste village is telling me what are they trying to monitor by flying the drone where women from our village go to relieve themselves uh, can they dare do the same in the upper caste villages so there are very you know uh, potential caste dynamics there uh, on the right you, you know the quote says that you should see how these baksas which is basically a scheduled tribe in india an, an indigenous community a very heavily marginalized community they run helter skelter when they see the drone flying over their heads while they are fishing so this is a village headman who's talking to me about the drone team uh, there is a woman who's saying when the drone came that day we all panicked um, as we did not know what it was it made a very loud buzzing so sound as if it were a thousand honey bees coming towards us we panicked and ran and my daughter who's two months pregnant tripped and fell thankfully nothing happened to her and on the right a very uh, disturbingly they are talking about another scheduled tribe group or a marginalized group called the one gujars uh, uh, and this is a forest official who's saying that these one gujars cannot be trusted they are muslims and have links to kashmir so kashmir as some of you might know is a disputed territory between india and pakistan has very heavy uh, uh, you know importance in the current nationalistic discourse in india uh and and he says that they can do anti national activities and they need to be monitored by drones so you see how like uh current discourses of national level politics also seeps in into uh, when conservation surveillance technologies are being used by the state finally there is this surveillance by the electronic eye system and uh, all of these towers there a uh, combination about 11 towers that are deployed on the southern boundary of the kobe tiger reserve and they face 
an adjoining state. So India has different states and uh, Corbett Tiger Reserve is a state called Uttarakhand. While the towers they are facing, uh, the southern boundary is, uh, uh, is shares with this state called as Uttar Pradesh. Uh, and Uttarakhand actually came out of Uttar Pradesh in the year 2000, so two decades before, uh, due to an ethnically uh, linguistic kind of a revolution and resistance movement. Uh, so this is how the uh, display of the electronic surveillance system looks like, and this is from the the field director's office. So on the left is a colored vision, and on the right is a thermal vision, and you can actually zoom in and see into people's homes on the other side of the national park as well uh, through that. Um, so there are some quotes here uh, where uh, somebody from Uttar Pradesh is saying, "What is the meaning of directing all those towers towards us? Uh, can't there be Sushant. any intro?" Sorry. Just yes. to just yes. to sorry to interrupt, your slide hasn't flicked on. Would you be able to Ooh. move it on so we can? Um, this is super can interesting. You... I'm so sorry to, to interrupt your role. Yeah, that's that's fine. So I was saying that there is, uh, uh, you know, through my interviews, that this very interesting quote that came up uh, from somebody from the Uttar Pradesh side of uh, the border of the Corbett Tiger Reserve, where they're saying, "What is the meaning of directing all those towers towards us? Can't there be any intrusion from the northern boundary?" This is the politics of showing us down. So the electronic eye is perceived by the people of Uttar Pradesh as a, a symbolism of showing them down because there are no electronic towers on the northern boundary. The justification for this that forest officials would say is that this is where most of the intrusion into the tiger reserve happens from. Uh, but you know, during the discussion, we'll come to the intrusion uh, again. Um, so there's also a quote where they say that, uh, you know, somebody again uh, from the other side of the border say, they say the cameras have night vision and can see all the way into our village. Forget being uncomfortable while collecting wood in the forest. I'm now uncomfortable in my own village, my own home. Um, right. Wait, I'm just going to skip through this because that's not what I'm going to do. So uh, as my research shows, conservation surveillance technologies have a wide range of social and political implications. Obviously, these are very context specific and my research is just based out of Corbett. Uh, but my work shows that uh, conservation technologies can exacerbate already prevailing inequalities of gender, caste, and class discrimination. And uh, conservation surveillance also triggers a multitude of resistance responses by various groups. So uh, when you have such negative perceptions towards conservation surveillance, there are obstructions to the use as well. Camera traps get stolen, they get uh, you, you know destroyed. Sometimes uh, just lit, you know fires are lit towards uh, when camera traps are put on. Uh, and then there are sometimes dedicated movements as well that, uh, you know, can obstruct people's use of these technologies. Um, yeah, I guess I'm done. So, uh, Lord's next. Maybe, we, uh, Steph, if you want to take questions, we can take some questions. Now as well. Yeah, there's a couple of questions. That was really interesting. Um, thank you so much. Um, there's a lot of really, uh, really good comments in, in the chat. But, um, Carly, did you want to jump in and ask a question? Uh, yeah, hi. Um, that was really fascinating stuff. And I loved the like gendered perspective that you that you made. Um, is there so what are these all like the forest guards? Are they all like employed by the government? And is it like regional government or national government? Are there like other NGOs in the area? Or is it just like this? What like what are the like, layers of power that are kind of overseeing this? That's a that's a very good question, Kali. Uh, so Corbett Tiger Reserve is part of what's called Project Tiger, and it comes under the central government. So forest guards are employed government employees of the central government. So they are, uh, they are basically the state. So they are government authorities. They are the lowest level functionaries, uh, but they are the they are as good as they're looked at as government, uh, you know, law enforcers. So uh, just like police constables, forest guards role, play the role of uh, policing uh, and, you know, uh, doing law enforcement around protected areas in India. OK, and are there any like local like is this all a government led thing or is the, are there any like bottoms up kind of local ngo type inv organizations so, involved because it seems like the best kind of stuff happens when like that is the case yeah so it's uh, again very interesting that uh, you know uh, initially uh, you know and it, it actually in most protected areas around india uh, a lot of these technologies are actually introduced by ngos uh, um, first uh, only recently, we've been seeing a trend in India where NGOs are, uh, you know, increasingly being sidelined 
uh, from doing camera trapping, especially when it comes to tiger reserves. You know, so you know, uh, tiger reserves are you know, a, a politically very charged areas. Uh, you know, they garner votes. There is a lot of discourse, especially when it comes to tiger reserves. You know, one tiger death and the entire news media goes berserk. So. Uh, you know, increasingly, you know, NGOs are being sidelined in these areas. So, but particularly in Corbett Tiger Reserve and most national parks or like that have tigers or are project tiger sites, it is the government which does the camera trapping. Uh, the NGOs are not really involved. So, and that's actually very important when it comes to deployment of surveillance technologies is that the state is in power. You know, the state has the final say. So even if there's an NGO that is doing uh, camera trapping work, they are actually bound to give all their data back to the government. Uh, and there have been many cases where NGOs have come across, uh, you know, if they've got pictures of people and if they do not want to share that data or if there is a picture of a tiger that they don't, and sometimes they don't share these images. And that becomes, again, very politically disadvantageous for them because then the government can just say, okay, you're not going to work in this area anymore. So uh, the NGOs are under a lot of pressure as well when, uh, when you know, when they are doing uh, camera trapping or using drones uh, in, in, in these landscapes. Uh, Rob, did you want to ask your question? Uh, hi, Trishan. Uh, it's just such a frightening, um, eye-opening uh, revelation that you, you're presenting. I've literally never thought of it, you know, along these lines, so it's quite terrifying. My question was, um, for what, what are the laws that they're supposedly enforcing with all these technologies? Why, why are they specifically using them? in that sense? That's that's a very good question, uh, Rob. So uh, it's tricky. So, you know, the boundaries between, uh, so supposedly this is, this is a national park and all our national parks have what's called a core area and a buffer area. Most people forget that there are a large number of people that live sometimes inside these protected areas or in the fringes. And they are legally allowed to go and collect forest produce in the buffer areas. Now, what happens is that uh, the state, the forest department, uh, uh, is particularly not very keen of people going inside because it becomes very difficult for them to manage such large areas in terms of law enforcement. What are the laws that they're actually trying to enforce is that they are not, they're trying to not allow people go inside core areas or uh, they just want to kind of limit people collecting the number of firewood, say, for example. There's, they always say there's a risk of poaching when people go inside. But, you know, these laws are actually very gray. And these areas, these, uh, you know, this area, there is no kind of strict boundary. There is no sort of a wall or a fence that separates a buffer area from a core area. These areas are very fluid. So it becomes very difficult for local communities also to kind of, uh, you know, determine what is buffer area and what is core area. Because traditionally, they've been practicing resource collection for many generations. So as I, as I said, and I demonstrated through my work, a lot of this actually, you know, when it comes to uh, enforcement of law or when it comes to kind of uh, prosecution of people, it comes from uh, entrenched inequalities within the society. So, uh, you know, so for example, if upper caste forest guard uh, inherently tries to kind of discriminate against lower caste people collecting forest produce or indigenous people collecting forest produce. So it, there is a long history of conflict between marginalized communities and, and the kind of uh, forest department in India, which, uh, and, and these conflicts kind of stem from that. So uh, I, I, kind of answering your question, what are the laws that they're trying to enforce? It's basically restricting people's movement inside protected areas. Uh, but the, again, those laws are also very gray. You know, there is uh, there are some, some, some places it is legally allowed, some places it is not. Uh, and it becomes very difficult to differentiate the two when on the ground. Oh, I mean, it's just such an, it just sounds like an awful situation where law enforcement is actually you know, a big part of the problem, it sounds like, because I imagine that there's not a lot of alternatives for these people in terms of finding produce, etc. Like there's no mm -hmm. alternative ways for them to do these sorts of things, I, I would suspect. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank yeah, you I'm, very much, Prashant. Yeah. One, one last question. Uh, Dan, did you want to jump in? Sure. My question was just, uh, I agree with everybody else. This is a fascinating discussion. And even if even if these issues have trickled across our minds, this is by far the most in-depth 
uh, survey of this area that I think I certainly that I've ever seen, and everybody else seems to agree. Uh, I missed it. Maybe on your first slide somewhere you said, has this been published? Are you planning to publish this? Just, or is there a link we can point people to? Because we want to have the same conversation in 100 other discussion groups. Right. Um, so I am in the final stages of writing up my PhD and have plans to publish multiple papers that will come out uh, uh, very soon, um, hopefully in the next uh, six to seven months. Uh, so I'll definitely, uh, you know, share to the, the wild labs forums. Papers. Yeah. Yes. Post to yes, wild labs uh, when you're sure. uh, when you're when they're up. Yes, but uh, also there is recently I did a plenary talk for the drone ecologies conference, and that's a more detailed uh, uh, kind of a conversation around this, where I particularly talk about conservation surveillance being used as a, a repression tool by the state. Uh, so um, and that I mean I can I can I can just e email the link to Steph, and that she can share on the wild labs group. Um, yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, oops. God, I'm having some tense issues. No, uh, Chishant, you are a yeah. member of Wild Lab, so you can actually. Oh, yes. I can, can do it myself. You can actually yes. start a whole discussion all about your research and host it uh, in the community. <laughs> yes, that's a good idea, Steph. As soon as I'm, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Okay, um, that was that was fantastic. And we're going to pick up. Uh, I know there's a lot of discussion happening in uh, the chat, and I'm going to pick it up in the panel discussion because I think um, the questions and comments that are being raised are actually going to be partly answered by our next two speakers, but also should be covered by everyone. Um, uh, <laughs> um, okay, we're going to hand over to Laura now. Um, and uh, speakers, uh, I also encourage you if you have the mental space to just keep it keep an eye on the chat and you might um, be able to pick up some of the questions in there as well. <laughs> 